week. Okay. We're live. Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos. You have joined us here today for Cultivating Voices live poetry. And this Sunday, it's our final reading of the month of July with our new books showcase featuring today three poets whose books have come out um, during this past year during um, or on just on the cusp of being available during um, the pandemic when um, those in-person readings are still a little hard to get to. But we started out in March of 20, of, of 20, uh, 2020 doing this to make sure um, and started our new book showcase uh, last July to make sure that folks with new books uh, were were having were one of the we were one of the places where folks could have a platform specifically to showcase um, new book format. I am Sandy Yunon, your host for today, joining you from Old Saybrook, Connecticut, uh, here in the fine place of New England although I often join you from Olympia, Washington. A tremendous welcome to all of you watching us live here in Zoom. We have a great audience assembled. And also, even though I can't see you, those of you whom I know are, have chosen to watch us live on our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Facebook page. You have so many opportunities to go to readings everywhere, um, all around the world. And it truly, truly humbles me that folks joined Cultivating Voices Live Poetry on Facebook and have continued to come back uh, week after week when possible to, to a participate in our reading series. And uh, I am thrilled to always have what I call the best seat in the house for these tremendous readings. And of course, it's very gratifying as a, as a person who uh, just on the edge of the pandemic had a new book of, of my own to be able to showcase as we do every other week, uh, folks with their new books. It's not very easy to launch a book during the pandemic, although um, although I have seen some just amazing, amazing examples of folks being very entrepreneurial in doing that. So I'm particularly uh, grateful to be able to be a small part of these book launches for folks. Uh, and always with an enthusiastic audience. And uh, of course, I hope all of you in the audience today will consider purchasing at least one collection if your resources allow, if not all three of the new books and maybe even some of books that preceded the new books today. We have the chat live in Facebook. We have the chat live here. Um, in Zoom. So please, please send love to the readers during the reading. Well, uh, our three readers today uh, are Mary Gilliland, Tamara Selman, and Max Vandersteen. I'll be introducing each of them individually as they read. And here we go. First up today is Mary Gilliland, whose award-winning collection is The Ruined Walled Castle Garden that came out in 2020. Recent poems of Mary's and her commentary have also appeared in The Fiddlehead, Matter, Stan, Tab, and Vallum, 
and her work has been anthologized in Nuclear Impact, Broken Atoms in Our Hands, in the and now awards the best innovative writing and is forthcoming in The Wild Gods. Mary's honors have included the Anne Stafford and Pablo Neruda Poetry Prizes and a Stanley Kunitz Fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center of Poet, uh, Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And I always, um, I, I love when I get to interact with, with poets that I, that I actually attend readings with periodically. So it's very, very um, heartening to be able to, to finally have Mary as one of our featured readers today here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Thanks for being with us, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction. And also, I want to thank you for opening, opening the Cultivating Voices umbrella for me. You see, folks, I'm on Twitter. I don't use Facebook. And so by special dispensation, I access this group for, through another poet, Peter Fortunato. So thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Um, I've completed an atomic elegy uh, excerpted in anthologies that Sandy mentioned, and I'll begin with a brief passage that occurs about halfway through this book length manuscript. One of my readers has called it a poem of quirkiness, outrage, underlying anxiety, and many voices apt for talking statues, news clips, and exclamations of the deceased. This elegy is set against the radiance of the high desert Southwest. It has rooms for Marie Curie, the Radium Girls, Los Alamos, and Fukushima. Uh, the poem also celebrates and mourns a character I have named Freddy. Uh, Freddy is a man who lived in New Mexico and was instrumental in the coalition that in 2003, got the state hate, hate crimes law amended to include lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. So uh, this is page 36 from Nuclear Family. Uh, the narrator is uh, recalling a celebration of the change in that legislation and also a stop that she and Freddie made at a bookstore in Los Alamos. Al would always sit out the dancing. He waved from our table, big smile, big black mustache. The fisherman and I paused for each round of applause for the governor's speech. A deputy from the Capitol offered his congratulations. The lights flicked on and off. Confetti snowed the white tablecloths. All the dancers switched partners and you were mine. Freddie, it was brilliant that the final team sent to lobby the legislature for passage was for women. You'd said the hardest part, years, not months, was convincing all the GLB and allied groups across the state in those days, the L's let you G's head the acronym, that the coalition had to add trans. In good time, Freddie, sitting in my museum, I remember while we stirred his coagulated cappuccino, the bookstore owner sprang to life, fire alarm like the bell at end of school day, but louder, unceasing. Mr. Bookstore had been telling his troubles with the T word, and there was that sideways push you could do with closed lips to make a dimple in your cheek. That little roll of your eyes, tell no one, but we know. In this brief shining moment of New Mexico, the only state in the union to have both hate crimes law and non-discrimination law include transgender people. <laughs> Release, not just the dim inside of that going down solely bookstore, but the whole small mall was ringing. The din let us escape 
to finish out our day trip after several days after the Coalition for Equality danced adorned with buttons. I got my rights on July 1st, 2003. 502 West leads out of Los Alamos to 84 and the switch south of Santa Fe to 85. Albuquerque's bowl of light is visible from Rio Rancho, the rosy peak of Sandia and all the bears that roam it cloaked in night. Now, uh, with many thanks to Bertha, thank you. With many thanks to Bertha Rogers for selecting the ruined wall castle garden um, to win the Bright Hill Press competition. I'll read several of the book's shorter poems. To the Dark House is about Virginia Woolf. And in the middle, the second of the three stanzas, I will change voices where the poem switches from she to I. In that middle stanza, Woolf speaks. To the Dark House. Her exorbitant mind withstood headache persistent as sea urchin spines. But neuroplasticity went narcolept when concatenations of specular voices clung like electric eels, nasty welts lodged in her cortex. Her whole word family halted at the border. The unspeakable splashed from its burrow, stronger than she, lush rupture of young body stilled, explored as though she were a country. Scratched dreams of ink have always brought me the next novel's shape, its true begin, trowling through talk, overheard in a shop on a corner. I carefully brush stray tendrils, the toque, cut of the jacket, length of the skirt, crux of a character who finds herself in a favorite chair, a room where she moves. This site would not excavate. It held sound waves, no footing, the ancient sea culling its sediment, a wet rush of grief and release, his chattering teeth after climax, her stifled bounds. The day was overcast. After lunch, she'd smoke her two sobranis, let wraiths roam her palate, then walk by the river, something in her pocket besides hands. Next poem is for our climate. <laughs> Is a transcendently beautiful place not to be ours? And the historic figure mentioned in this poem, Emma Meal, survived a 19th century hurricane that hit New Orleans. The sea bangs about and sweeps out half the earth of Ile Dernière with half its 1856 summer residents chance combination of genes or plans based on the weather consign personal fate to probability. How many can rise to the side of the saints and float among the rocks in a white dress? Shifting winds sweep Emma Meal back in. Little bags for keeping miracles streak her cheeks, lumps of fool's gold. On the last barrier island, entranced, shivering beneath the doctor's stethoscope, Emma fever dreams. The great clod across the marsh channels erodes with each storm strike. In the century after steam, then the century after flight, mortals will rebuild, sight rocks to float among. Infinitives. To admit fields are on fire, oil fields, though we do not yet see them burning. To remember our grandparents sweltered each summer, waiting for the streetcar for nightfall. 
to irrigate loosened earth with native water, to bail out the seed banks, to chew our food, to call the bluff of the brand name the marketing genius, to digest resources burnt to a crisp threshold, to savor our craving, to satiation, to be free of litter strewn beyond us, steering through the Hesperides, sacred groves, blessed isles, past the ghost of a man on the moon's new frontier, our course set for the destitute sunset. The United States has been waging a war in one place or another ever since it ever since it came into existence and I've been increasingly conscious of militarism as a, a really vile root of all the hostile isms. Two phrases in the next poem were original names for Baghdad. Those phrases are city of peace and gate of the gods. Occupied. Bruised ribs, raked shins in the search for a sweet grape among dry vines. Endlessly back and forth, reading maps, reading the legends, city of peace, gate of the gods. Standing knee deep in the mud of an untilled field, a rogue bull amid the red dirge. Hub of bricks on the floodplain, submerged save for its fame, re upped streets radial from the gardens, called again to prayer, land of marshes and sand, looted and forced, and forced once more. Bone chips rattling, arms gone to a roadside bomb, meat cold in the bowl. Do I have time for one more? I forgot to, I forgot my start time. One more? Okay. Um, so this is the uh, source of the chat book uh, title. It's the last poem in the book, Earthly Mishaps. And um, Mare's tail is mentioned. It's a, vigor, a very vigorous plant. Also mentioned in the poem is Brother Cadfael. Uh, he is a fictional 12th century herbalist and monk who solves murder mysteries. And the poem speaker is a man, he's a, a gardener, uh, speaks this poem. Earthly mishaps, faint humming, inexorable in the damp, below the ruined walled castle garden, mare's tail tunnels an eight foot root. Sly boots, I've spaded the circle, reached to my elbow, still the plant breaks. As Eve brought a man his labor, it will multiply tenfold. I shop for survival, a sprayer to level pride, melancholy, and unwanted shoots. The canister is lowered from its shelf, bagged in plastic. The till rings, keys in hand. I see the car park as a horse tracked swale where Catfail leads his roan, saddle bagged with an apothecary box, medieval herbicide. As he stumps through mud, the monk's brass scale tips. One pan sways with the bitterness of interrupted life, the other, Eve's radical helplessness. So I'd love to email with anybody who would like to contact me through my website and thank you all for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Mary. You've been hearing from Mary Gill Gilliland reading from the ruined wall castle garden. And what a, you know, what a really ex exquisite range of poetry coming from different pla uh, places of consciousness, you know, raising consciousness. I mean, uh, I, I, I marvel at the, at the poet that can take us to those many, many places um, in 
in a lyrical in a lyrical way because I tend to have a one track mind in my poetry. So I really, really, really appreciate um, when uh, when when I get to hear about not LGBTQ rights through poetry, uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, you know, these are the uh, nuclear issues of, of 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 nuclear threat. All this vast range of things um, from one individual whose eyes are wide open to the world and sharing that sense of urgency around humanity with us. Thank you, Mary. Um, what a pleasure to have you finally reading with us. And I hope you will be back soon. And of course, thank you to Bertha Rogers as well. <laughs> great, great to have you. Well, next, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that there, there I, I, I sometimes meet poets who are like, they know how to, they know all about promotion, like in, in the best way of how to merge the business of writing poetry with the business of bringing poetry to platforms. And, and when I had the chance to go to um, Tamara's launch, I was just, I marveled at, at, you know, at the way that you presented your work, but also brought the audience into your work and have, and, and have found these really unique ways to let people know about your very important collection that we'll be featuring today, Intention Tremor, um, and, and how you also use, have been using your poetry to promote change, social justice, and educate with, again, profound, um, profound poetry with, with some very serious intention. And that, so I, I, I so much respect what you do. Let me share the formal biography um, with you all. Uh, Tamara Selman wrote her memoir, a me uh, Intention Tremor, which is a hybrid collection of prose and poetry forms in the five years that followed her diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Dozens of her poems, short stories, essays, and other writings have been published or anthologized since the mid 1990s. She's won several awards. But these days, in addition to sharing this very um, poignant, primal, necessary memoir in prose and poetry, Tamara spends much of her time gardening, camping, bird watching, hiking, when she's, as I said, when she's not writing or teaching others how to write their own illness narratives. And, and isn't that the essence of, in some ways, this reading series, Cultivating Voices, to, to also be using poetry as the platform to encourage everyone to share their narratives um, in their unique ways. It is a real pleasure to have you with us today and um, to welcome you to the program, even particularly because I've had the chance to see you read a number of times and always appreciate it. But I really am grateful to have you here on Cultivating Voices. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so humbled. I almost wanted to start crying. <laughs> I have to say that you have been really great about coming and you're a fantastic reader in a Zoom environment. Not everybody is. It's hard. And it's just, I, I just love it when your face is there because I know you're listening and you're just, 
you're you're giving me the feedback that what I wrote matters and that it's getting through. And that's what we all want to do. That's all we want to do. I don't want to write a book that just sits on a shelf. I want people to read it. So um, I'm really humbled and privileged and honored to even be in this series. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I Here's a copy of my book. This is what it looks like. And thank you. And um, it came out in January. And it has been really, really, really hard to get uh, readings and any kind of attention, a debut author during a pandemic, writing, you know, a mixture of poetry and prose is not going to maybe capture a lot of attention. But I, I have to say that this book is, I wrote this book to raise awareness, to educate people. Um, it's what I do for a living during the day as a writer. Um, and I want to let people know that um, I am donating 100% of my take from the sales of this book to a nonprofit called the Accelerated Cure Project, who uh, they work together to um, help researchers expedite their research. They do a lot of data collection, and they also uh, have a, a really important community aspect to them in which they support people with multiple sclerosis through policymaking um, events that they take on and manage at the uh, Washington DC level. So um, every dollar that I make from this goes to them. So I'm not, if you want to buy a book, you know, buy it for them. Don't buy it for me, buy it for them and buy it for yourself. Cause I think there's something in this book for anyone, whether you are sick or not. And I, I only hope and that my main goal was to write a book that was sort of a, a memoir, but also maybe a roadmap for someone in the future who may be facing down a chronic illness uh, diagnosis. So thanks so much for having me. I'm going to start where else, but literally at the beginning. Um, this is a prose poem. Um, this is how it all probably started, but we'll never know for sure because I wasn't diagnosed until age 47. But uh, there's two uh, phrases in this poem that I want to share. It's a prose poem. One of them is the term intercostal, and that stands for the muscles that um, help, that are in between your ribcage, and they help you to breathe, help your, your uh, ribcage to expand and contract so that your lungs can take a deep breath. And then the other term is pleurisy, which is a lung condition of sort of uncertain origin. It's kind of an old timey term people used when they didn't know what else to call it. They just call it pleurisy, okay? So that's important for you to know. This poem is called August 1975. It first happened when she was a month shy of 10, a curly, a curly brown ribbon of a girl who played softball, fished for crappie, read books in her cool walkout basement on hot summer days, rode her bike in endless circles. A girl without a stitch of fat, a lean muscular thing, flush with the energy that radiated from the ever curious coals of her brain. A perpetual motion kind of girl, but an obedient girl who rarely asked for attention, who rarely complained of anything except for going to bed at a decent hour. That day, she would pick blackberries in the orchards across the street with one of many best friends named Michelle she would have throughout her life. She laced her shoes, tugged her hand-me-down Wrangler cutoffs into place, grabbed the Tupperware bowl and stood. There, large grips, stiff and unrelenting, pinched her around the ribcage. She likened them to the curved claws of a 1960s TV show robot. Her fingers fumbled the bowl. It banged in the hollow plastic voice across the wood parquet floor. Instinctively, she stood even straighter than before, tried to breathe. Those intercostal efforts abandoned as the cinching grew severe. Her breath came shallow, followed by stars in her eyes. Her grandmother sidled in from the kitchen. Raise your arms. The girl tried to, but the pain seized fresh her ribcage, spasming. Her brown eyes pooled with involuntary tears. She dropped to the floor a cat on all fours, writhing in the grips 
of an invisible vice. Excuse me. As quickly as it had stormed her body, the seizure released. She heaved, young lungs refreshing, tears dropping like rain to dot the squares of yellowed wood around her star-shaped hands. Her mother walked in then, concern in her eyes. Just a touch of pleurisy, her grandmother said. And what I describe in that poem is what is called the MS hug. Not, I, you know, totally ironically, because there's nothing pleasant about having this happen. And it's probably the one symptom that I continue to have, and it still hurts like heck. So <laughs> um, one of the chief reasons I went to see the doctor at age 47 um, was a symptom that uh, I think all of you will appreciate. Um, it would make you worry as well. Um, I couldn't read one day. I went back to school at age 47 uh, to study sleep medicine or sleep technology. And I cracked open this giant sleep medicine tome and I sat down and I couldn't read. I could see the letters and the words and the pictures and everything, but I couldn't read. So I'm going to show you, this is um, a blackout poem and it's called uh, with Alexia without graphia. Alexia is a word for being unable to read or comprehend read, read material. And agraphy is the inability to write something that you can otherwise communicate. And um, this blackout poem uses a letter to the editor from the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry from 1996. With Alexia without agraphia. I need my glasses, hold on. I'm going blind in my old age. Oh, okay. Oh, so much better. With Alexia without agraphia. Initial manifestation, a week long inability to read. Speech fluent and normal, could write fluently on dictation. Spontaneously able to name objects, letters, colors, and numbers, unable to read the whole world. According to Poser criteria, retrochiasmal disease and higher level visual disturbances, clinically silent, with alexia, without agraphia. First described by Desjardins in 1892, lesions disconnecting pathways demonstrated Severe disturbance of reading comprehension. Compromise. True for patient as initial manifestation. Unusual first reported result from multiple sclerosis. Thank you. This next one, I'm gonna roll right into the diagnosis poem because I mean, this is the beginning of the journey really once you've finally confirmed something uh, suddenly you really can't go back. And quite simply, this poem is called Diagnosis. Here is the proof, Dr. K said, clicking magnetic scans of my brain, the remarkable white holes, the countless grains of sand, I'm sorry, the countless grains of salt that could grow larger. I have a lesion too, she admitted. Who knows how it got there? I'm a neurologist and I know how it could be anything but, except in my spinal fluid, cells not normally invited across that porous aquatic barrier have left behind their spore. Over time and space, narratives in the vault of my medical records corroborate symptoms. The tremoring leg, the relentless fatigue, the crawling skin, the crackling sparklers across my scalp, the incessant tinnitus, the times I've left sentences unfinished, don't even recognize when I have spoken words at all. Impossible elements in a perfect cytokine storm. How to right this ship is still a matter for lab rats, longitudinal volunteerism and trial and error. Choose a new normal, choose a life of pill bugs, or you can choose what's behind door number three. Her expression was plaintive. What will it be? Honesty. She finally smiled, nodded, said, walk heel to toe for me, pointing. And I did.
Okay, so I'm going to just write this one because I read this one because it's just so much fun to read and everybody can relate whether you're sick or not. Let me tell you when nobody in this room has not done this, we've all done this, <laughs> double negative. Um, when you find that you have some unusual symptoms, what do you do? You go to Dr. Google and you look it up and then you just discover this whole weird world of uh, online medicine, quote unquote. So you'll all find this familiar, I'm pretty sure. It's called The Expert and it's prose poem. The expert sits online, overstimulated by blue spectrum light scouring for evidence, though all he understands is purely anecdotal. The first person accounts the stories from a friend of his sister's boyfriend's boss. He misinterprets clinical studies, decides two and two equal five, wonders why science is taking so long to discover a capital C cure. He is not a biologist, but he might be a theologist. He does not know B cells from jail cells, from T cells, from killer cells, from super cells. He thinks the cure is known, locked in a cylinder, in a vault, in Antarctica, where nobody will ever find it except through an act of espionage. He thinks sick people are the cash cows of the corporation, that vaccines are for fools, that medicine is poison, big pharma the enemy. But vitamins are miracles, even when they cost you your electric bill. And if you drink special water, ate special diets, performed special yoga poses, the gut biome would reverse itself and eliminate your dis-ease. Our web evangelizer believes you will fall for his friendly profile picture, the posts about his dogs, his misspelled words, and conspiracy theories posted at hours when only insomniacs breed. Who knows who he really is? To be sure, we could all stand to look in the mirror to see who we are and who we are not. It's, it's, been, it's been a minute with this uh, online, you know, craziness, hasn't it? <laughs> so about three years after my diagnosis, it took me about that many years to kind of just deal, to, to get through all the stages of grief, because that's really what you do. And along the way, there are lots of things you pick up. And one of them is this term MS warrior, which I've always found really strange. We are not superheroes and neither are we just, you know, woe is me, pathetic human beings. In fact, we're somewhere in the middle. And I recently watched the movie Crip Camp and I really found it interesting that it, they always kept coming back to just treat us like human beings, right? Uh, people who are disabled have illness, so forth and so on. I found it oddly ironic that the major disability rights activist that was spotlight was in the spotlight for the Crip Camp movie was named, her name is Judy Human. Let's take a clue, right? <laughs> so I felt, I went through all the things and about three years later, I took to task the term MS warrior in this poem. The, the first line is its title. The year I came home from the war followed three years spent grieving fresh diagnosis. During my time in those trenches, a bloodless coup commenced cold and indifferent. My gray matter calloused, my stomach shredded and relined itself. The ringing in my ears roared despite the silence of it all. Later, the flash grenades I'd lobbed at robot insurers and ignorant minions of Dr. Google were the same hot potatoes that blasted me a path to my new normal after MS reassigned my orders. In peacetime, I'm a, I'm a civilian now and yet my war wounds persist. Surprise attacks of nerve pain across dermatomes, the sabotage of my vitality by an unseen enemy, the inactive lesions and distressing side effects of medications. When symptoms reemerge, I perform reconnaissance reconnaissance missions to rule out foreign invaders. There is no such thing as diplomacy in this Cold War, nor should you call me a warrior in spite of the armor of my intellect, which I've used to forge words into worthless ballistics. 
I did not volunteer to become a veteran of this exhausting assault on my spirit. If you catch me looking over my shoulder, I'm not looking for a fight, but for reasons not to fight at all. All right, and I have one more quick one because I do have a sense of humor and that's the way you get through things in the world, whether it's a chronic illness or you lost your job or a pandemic or all of these things, right? You got to laugh. And so here is my new normal, a picture of that, a day in my life. And again, I want to tell you to visit intentiontremorbook.com if you're interested in buying the book and that your purchase will definitely help uh, a nonprofit help people with MS and their researchers trying to find a cure. Thanks again. Sideways. Yesterday, I woke up sideways. Descending the stairs, I used the railings without white knuckles. I don't fear new adventures anymore. My eyes cocked 45 degrees left of center, even when the crown of my head pointed straight up to the chakra constellations that orbit their invisible do my eyes look funny? I asked him. He shook his head. Is my mouth drooping? He answered no. Am I walking a straight line? My eyes at slant noted the floor, found no evidence of ersatz gravity, which I assumed would be the natural outcome of life on the diagonal. You look fine to me, he said. So I sat at my desk and got to work on deadlines. Thank you again so much for listening and for being here. It's been my pleasure to read today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There is no such thing as diplomacy. What a, I mean, you know, what a way to, um, you know, hold that truth in that line, like for, for your journey. There's so much um, in the chat about um, how you use the confluence of, of science and, um, and even the, the language of militarization um, to discuss, you know, the very real Judy human, human way that, that, um, one with MS moves from, as you mentioned, that disorientation, like that came from literally not being able to read to then being able to, to share, to empathize, to educate, um, and really serve uh, as, as an activist uh, to, to support others. So, um, not only through, not only through the dis-ease of MS, but I also think the connections with how we also think about ourselves as people who are sick or well, and what and what does that really mean? Uh, you and I have had conversations about this, and I, I, I again, I very, very much appreciate um, how. How you've how you've used your story to connect and empathize and bring people into their stories, and um, again, I can't uh, emphasize enough. Please consider, you know, purchasing books today, folks. Um, you know, Tamara's donating proceeds for the continued exploration of that capital C cure for for MS and I uh, so appreciate um, your efforts to um, use your experience, but to do that good work through that. I mean, you're, you're amazing and I can't, then I love the work, thank you. And of course I look forward, this is the last reading on your virtual book tour. Thanks for making it on Cultivating Voices, but I look forward to hearing more of your work, of course. <laughs> Around town. Thank you. <laughs> well, our last reader today on our new books showcase, um, and I'll come back at the end and tell you what's up for next week and uh, I'll give you a little preview of August. Our next reader is our good friend, 
where where I usually am would be to the north. Um, this time where I am a little north, well, more than a little northwest. Uh, our good friend up in Edmonton, Canada, that great province of Alberta, um, Max Vandersteen, uh, whom you've heard read on the open mic uh, here on Cultivating Voices on different times and our different reading platforms. And now, of course, we're very, very uh, happy to be able to, uh, to support uh, Max through launching um, Max's new collection, and it's always a great uh, pleasure to hear your voice and have your voice be among the voices that we have here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Well, Max Vandersteen took up writing poetry when he retired from a career in pipe fitting. And those of you who were with us for our May Day reading, um, Max shared a, a really ama uh, amazing set that, that, that spoke to um, that career of his and the, the labor that he did um, as that pipe fitter. He writes about, in addition to, um, in, in addition to uh, working class and labor issues about social justice, including the personal and global consequences of work in the petrochemical industrial field. And Max is the vice president of the board for the Edmonton Stroll of Poets, uh, which is the Edmonton and the Edmonton affiliate manager for the Ontario Poetry Society, otherwise known as TOPS, and a member of Parkland Poets based in Stony Plain, Alberta. So you can, um, you know, Max is well versed in also hosting reading series. And uh, you have many opportunities. I encourage you to, um, to go in a different uh, direction and head to Canada for either the Stroll of Poets um, or the Parkland Poets series. They're really, really great series to attend. Max's latest book is Work of Words from Beret Days Press. And he also has published the Iguanas of El Rey in 2013 and Fair Play in 2016, both with Ex Libris. Feel free to contact Max. You'll see in the chat how to contact him to get a copy of um, Work of Words, because uh, it's just not quite out with the publisher yet, uh, as far as I understand, but Max has copies. And please join me in welcoming Max Vandersteen. Thank you so much for that introduction and your warm welcome, Sandy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and follow Mary and Tamara and all the great voices that have been here week after week on Cultivating Voices. And as you uh, did read in my bio, I am a retired pipe fitter and did decide to try and give back a little and write about social justice and and in a new field that's emerging, um, petropoetics, uh, I shall call it, I guess. It's in my book, Work of Words, uh, a lot of poetry about my experiences in the petrochemical industry and some of the consequences personally and globally of that, of that industry. So I'd like to start out with a poem, uh, a little bit about my introduction into pipe fitting. It's called, Hear Me Out. I chanced to join the fitting racket that sounded just a tad too good to be true. I drew a slip for seven tens, day shifts at Suncor for more than just a worthwhile debut. Howling gears of a crewman transport bus, grinding slow and loud down the gravel hill, descends us new hires into their bunkers, a buzz with plant hum, although tranquil still. Trauma of the clamor, part of induction to professions practiced in resonance. Careers carried out in cacophony, earning sustenance despite the dissonance. The hubbub of the job proved more a hoopla as the light and dark hours of the day roared by crews either working or sleeping while the audible ruckus was ignored. 28 straight shifts in that deafening din, laboring through the blare that's always there, clanging, banging, 
and strangling the senses until one becomes sense scarcely aware. During these years of a raucous career, I lived fast and loud in a young man's space. With age toning down the drowning sounds, my world becomes a quieter place. Mm, mm, mm. So uh, a few poems I'd like to read here about some of the experiences within that industrial setting. Uh, this first one is called Instrumental Machines and it's about working on a night shift where there's not a lot of people around and uh, it's a little different kind of eerie world. Instrumental machines. Working the wee hours of plant operation, ambivalent serenity conceals the presence of non-evident motion and an obscure orchestra, most surreal. Night shift quiet is subtly amplified by a descanting heart beating rhythm, yet muffled by the plugs in my ears in industrial plaintive composition. A pulsing fluids pump through the piping, chorus of compressors thumbing, drumming percussion, a staccato of steam hammer in the high lines, like a pinging interplant discussion. Droning murmurs of motors hard driven, whistles of steam escaping heat tracing, and spattering of cooling tower waters, an ensemble of sounds interlacing, a serenade of clangor and clamor, in unison, a soulful symphony, a concert of cadence and harmony created from chanted asynchrony. Uh, this next poem is about a specific kind of job during a shutdown where a tank was emptied out for uh, tradesmen to go in and do some repairs and it's called Aurora Diametrica. One immense tank amidst many in the farm in envelopment appears disparate, ringed and cluttered with crowds of equipment, rumbling, smoking, working to repair it. Heaters, generators, fans and welders, lights and bottles of compressed air or gases, and a mass of ducts and cords and hoses, and everything through the manhole passes. Lights strung like a stellar display, melding in the midst, in the mist encompassed within, hazily radiate a surreal scene, seems not real, but more like science fiction. Through brumous atmosphere inside the drum, two orbs appear spaced geometrical as opposing manways beacon each other like an aurora diametrica. Portals providing access and egress, an exchange of in and external places, lenses to and from this mystic moonscape, complete with images of lunar faces. Symmetrical men watch from the thresholds, keeping their eye on our situation. They are but two conduits to the planet, and there are only two views of this constellation. Green clad, we umbilical aliens, restoring integrity and function, created inside the vague and vaporous vessel, nebulous seams of nexus and unction. In pairs, smoke and sparks and light surrounding, like rituals performed for prayer or repair, in earnest, we restitute the inner space. Inside, our concern is getting out of there. Um, the next one I'd like to read is actually a three-part poem, and it's um, kind of dealing with some of the science and physics of, of our trades. And uh, it's called Laws of Motion, as we all know some of the physics laws. Part one is called Behavioral Designs. On a work deck at the exchanger head and a hot sunny day on that scaffold, attaching the ratchet to nut 60, Pascal's hypothesis has us baffled. Reckon he nor Isaac Newton ever knew the specs or torques their theories would impact upon mechanics and technology where procedures and values interact. Bemused, we believe and adopt the creed of laws established in Renaissance ages with our community's doctrines now driving industrial tools, routines, and wages. A rotational force of physics and labor with cross-pattern torque sequence defined. 64 studs circle the vessel tubes, 
each with a number and measure assigned. From one to 33 to 17, 49, and then start again at two, passing the impact driver back and forth until each nut is tightened by the crew. The sequence is repeated to guarantee specified values of foot pounds or jewels in accordance with both engineering and local trade union bylaws and rules. Either dictated or legislated, Newtons of force, Newton meters of torque, ordinances, provisions, and standards regulate most conditions of our work and of our power expelled, refitting facilities by rules bodied therein. Laws of motion enacted in exchange like energy shifts between media within. When momentum transforms to inertia, the equal and opposite reaction across the process or the labor force as determined by laws of mass action, elevated friction in the systems impedes mechanism, induces rupture and other unintended twists until torsion results in compromised structure. So part two is another type of work um, in, uh, in a plant, industrial plant. It's uh, called Plummet from the Summit and it's about working on the side of a tower. On a platform clutched aside the tower, thrusting through decks over vessels below, two men attempt to don their PPE with no room to turn or recess to go. 120 feet above ground, swing gate and railing their security and protection from Sir Isaac Newton's standard for universal gravity. Attractive forces favor objects proportionally according to mass, where the pull to earth renders a reckoning with power mortals cannot overpass. To replace a probe outside the framework, a transmitter to relay the pressure within reach and easily accessible, yet beyond the barricade, however. Compromising equipment containment and exposing unsecured tools to the odds of human skill and scrutiny versus fortuity and the will of the gods. Celestial forces follow physics strictly according to elemental laws where the draw of earth delivers solid grounds to claim the consequence of faulty cause. Most inexplicable when it happened, the event was the descent of a wrench that plunged and ricocheted through the piping when it slipped from the tradesman's outstretched clench. The clangorous scream of steel on steel echoed the persistent piercing sound. On its caroming descent to the men, anxiously seeking shelter on the ground. Foreboding forces threaten above relative to a menace of horrors, where the will to survive impels men to flee for the safe buffer of covered quarters. And part three is called patterns of the masses, another type of uh, motion uh, now uh, leaguering a lot of tradesmen moving back and forth to where the work is, right? Uh, all patterns of the masses. On the staging inside a reactor, an assemblage of men crowd the workspace and share the workload as a composite crew of varying trade, race, age, and birthplace. Boilermakers, pipe fitters and welders, apprentices, journeymen, young and old, men from the West, from the Rock, and from Quebec, some of sloth or spirit, and every fold. A collaborative force laboring collectively, mostly far from their homes, bustling to construct the diffusers and engage like a swarm of devoted drones within latticed honeycombs of the hive. The money is the honey to which they're lured, warranting the itinerant lifestyle to which many have now become inured. Men with dependence, debts, and compulsion to journey miles away from family, able men and skilled with dreams and desires Thankful for this opportunity, fellow travelers, tradesmen, and brothers financially coerced to relocate and drawn by jobs in Alberta's oil sands congregated here to collaborate on the rebuild of this refinery as long as it takes and long as it lasts. From this job, likely back home in the union hall, according to their jurisdictional contracts. But here for the hall, be it long or not, to earn what they can, where and while they can, not thriving, but surviving the cycle until they may escape from the caravan, commuting cross country for a living and hopes to undertake their vocation. Forces of economic enticement 
today have modified the equation instituted through science and physics and appended workplace laws of motion to integrate a contingent impact moving masses through laws of migration. So as said, um, a lot of time at work is spent away from home and family. And I'd like to share a couple of poems. I'd like to share lots of poems, but I'd like to share a couple of poems here that uh, deal with that issue of being away from home from a personal point of view. Um, one is called, the first one here is called The Night Before. It's um, night before preparing to leave for a couple of weeks of work. The night before the transit will leave, whether I'm on it or not, my steel-toed boots, woolen socks, deerskin gloves, and two alarm clocks, whether I'll need them or not, mostly fill the smudgy satchel, positioned steady against the back porch door, ready, like a transverse sentry, barring both exit or entry, whether I get up or not. The fright before the transfer will come, whether I will it or not, my dear children and gentle wife, those most important in my life, whether I'm with them or not, mostly fill the motley thoughts steadily mixing in back of my mind, transfixing choice between security of currency or family, whether I'm there for them or not. Before the light, the transition will overcome, whether I force it or not, my longings for peace and serenity and my bonds to home and family, whether I'm in it or not. They mostly fill the saddened psyche, steadily lurking all the while the body's away working to put food on the table and make things more stable, whether I like it or not. Uh, another one here, again, about being away from family and what you're missing, you know, when you're away there's so much and things that happen at home, it's called my girl. Miss you, I do, with the first breath I take each morning, feeling here is a mistake. In my cradling arms, if you could be, baby. If you were here, I'd adhere to you, maybe. Accelerate days if I could do, honey. Abbreviate nights for any amount of money. To exchange the relived recollection for a living and loving connection. Eliminate miles between us, sugar. And terminate the treadmill camp rigor for delicious wishes and benevolent wants that my longing heart and soul daily haunts. To witness your life and maturation, to share growth and your social education. Dial into not up, I'd rather, sweetheart. Being with you'd be better than apart. Feel your tender love and admiration instead of recurrent mutual frustration. Justify, if I could, my weekly migration, or rectify, if they would, the work situation. Sooner or later, hell or high water, I vow not to bow out on you, daughter, to swim free of this solitary girl before you're no longer my little girl. Um, just a couple more poems, if I could, about, like I was saying, about personal and uh, global consequences. Uh, this one here deals more with personal consequences that I am so grateful when I came to upon retirement that I still have a healthy life in front of me compared to so many of my brothers and sisters that have passed away at early ages from exposures and what have you, accidents. This is called a trade. Liken me to any of the many men who have left the playing field, luckier than some at the outcome when the recap is revealed. We are kicking through the litter on the sidelines or in the coal mines feeling just a little bitter. I was beckoned totally by the money, but now I wonder at it all. When I recall the conditions we worked under, we thought then worthwhile to attain and maintain a family lifestyle. Reckon me fortunately uninfected by the contaminants in the air, carbon hexes and fibrous asbestos that lingered everywhere. Figure me inflicted to forgive over benzenes and carcinogens dioxins and mutagens we endured so that we could live. Imagine me far from where sulfur saturates the air. Picture me on a Caribbean island where no bitumen inhabits the sand, 
where mercury rises in the thermometer, not throughout the local water. Define me proudly by my trade, but protect me from the trade I made. And one more, just a short one about some of the effects and the lingering effects of all these refineries in our landscape and uh, the legacy they live, it's, they leave poems called landmarks. Transient, those boundaries of the refinery, ever reclaimed at the perimeter by bears, ravens, choking vegetation, and erosive forces grown of nature. An impermanent emblem is assembled upon a legacy of fossils yields, destined to join the fossilized legacies of pyramids, plantations, and battlefields. Chronically attacked from within and out, there is no security in pretense or fences. Just as threatened, the culture bound therein, there is no sure welfare in unions or pensions. Paraffin wax, coyote tracks, and clawbacks suggest a retrogressive admixture. Wolves, moguls, wild cats, and plutocrats compromise the convoluted picture. From parameters, but semi-established, with a collective commonly agreed to, comes fight, flight, hide from sight, in a cycle often afflicted with corporate greed, too. Pipes and beams seed just as the blocks, steels, and trenches. Once kings, poles, or boards conflict the systems, collapse and ruin are the historical victims, nature and labor, the ethical victims. Thank you so much for listening and uh, look forward to being back next week. Thanks. Thank you so much, Max. The, the, the new book is The Work of Words. And of course, you'll see in the, you'll see in the chat um, so much discussed about how you were able to you know, intersect that dialogue of, Sir, of even the laws of motion and Sir Isaac Newton that that and, and the use of rhyme and taking the work of words and really also discussing the words of work and as you said the consequences of that the the human consequences and the toll on the planet again um what i really have appreciated today is how you know each one of our three poets has has brought, you know, has brought a close eye to some very significant issues that um, I will use the word that that plague us. I will use the word plague. I'll use it that plague plague us as humans and also um, all the species that we share the planet with, as well as the planet, um, even. At, even at the sake of our well-being, which is often called our paycheck. So uh, I thank you, all three of you, for the ways that you have illuminated your unique positionality in the world and your story, but uh, broad, broadened it to connect us to, um, to issues that, that affect each of us, even though we are not inside the specific story that you've lived within. Folks, you've heard today on our new book showcase, um, the poetry of Mary Gilliland, Tamara Salman, and Max Vandersteen. And before I close us out with a few announcements, how about we unmute and uh, share our appreciation with some applause and hoots and hollers for our three our three readers today. Thank you all for being with us. Great, great stuff. And, and, what, and, and, and what the power of poetry can, um, let no one ever say that poetry and social justice and social issues should never meet. They always need to meet. The personal is always political. 
and the political is deeply, deeply personal. Uh, and we we and we had that exemplified today. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a few of our readings that are coming up in August. But before I we did that, um, while I'm sharing this, um, this is a great time if you want to put anything in the chat about upcoming readings that you have or any announcements, feel free to type those in the chat. And I'm wondering if Billy Brown is um, still here in our audience. Um, I would love it if Billy would unmute and um, share uh, with our audience a special event that is coming up this Thursday that, that he will be hosting that, that myself and John Roach of Cactus Reading Series and Bill Nevins, um, we've been collaborating with Billy of the Fixed and Free Reading Series in Albuquerque on behalf of our very, very dear friend, Amit Dahi uh, Billy, are you here and could you, would you be willing to share a little bit about what we're up to this upcoming Thursday? Yes, yes, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. And I see that Amit is with us. Greetings to my brother Amit in Delhi. Uh, yes, we're going to have, uh, I believe at this point, we have 32 poets, uh, many of whom are well known uh, across the country and from uh, other countries as well, and who will read in honor of and in support of our dear friend Amit, and uh, we will be uh, encouraging people to donate funds to help Amit with his medical equipment and treatment uh, needs. And um, I will, at the beginning of this reading, I put a, an item in the chat, but I'll repeat it. And so you may contact me if you wish to get more information about this. And as I understand it, Sandra, you also be posting something in uh, Cultivating Voices Live. Is that correct? We sure will be put. Yes, we'll sure will be putting information about how folks can join the reading next of uh, this upcoming Thursday, which is going to be six thirty to eight thirty Mountain Time uh, here in um, the Northern Hemisphere. Six thirty to eight thirty Mountain Time will be the that that would be that will be five thirty Pacific. That would be uh, that will be seven thirty central and on the east on the east coast, folks. You'll be you be joining from uh, nine thirty to eleven thirty, um, and uh, I'd have to do a little bit of in the math of my head overseas, but we'll have all those time zones available so folks can join us. Um, and we do have folks joining us from time zones that are not necessarily favorable to them, but because uh, this is truly, uh, uh, the, the, a lot of the poets reading are from New Mexico. That's where John and Bill and, and Billy are uh, do their good work, um, but we're bringing some other poets in from around the, from around, um, from around the world to support in this, uh, in the support of our, our dear brother, as you said. So thank you, Billy, for all your work putting this together. And um, of course, we look forward to hearing Amit's reading on Thursday as well. We love you and we're really happy to be able to do this together. And I'll be posting information on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry um, to let you all know how you can join the reading and send support um, uh, to support Amit's well-being and good health. I want to add uh, that uh, among those people who are here now, of course, Amit will be reading approximately 20 minutes. So uh, as he said in a poem that he posted earlier, he'll be reading his heart out. And Sandra will also be reading and Don Krieger will be reading. And I'm not sure if anyone else. Uh, on yeah, Kim Ports is reading. Kim's here. I'm trying to see who else is in the room, but yeah, number of people. Mary Oishi will be joining from Poet Laureate of Albuquerque. And yeah, a lot of folks. Uh, Fergus Hogan, uh, Angela Driven, a number of people. So we're grateful for all the folks who have signed on from all the different reading series to read. And uh, thank you, Billy. And okay. I mean, of course, 
Great. We'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for your good work and stay strong. Stay strong, my brother. We'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Well, friends, you are here today. Um, again, I hope you can join us on Thursday. Uh, we'll be posting on how you can participate uh, in supporting Amit's um, getting that, getting that, so it's called an oxygenator for, um, for his breathing. And we're really happy to support. Um, if you don't know, Amit's done work with, has, has, has done some pretty considerable work in India. And he'll, he'll talk about that on Thursday. Um, or he might not, but I want to let you know that he's devoted much of his life to saving the tiger and has raised over a half a million dollars for poetry to do that. So that the least that we can do is um, raise some funds to support his breathing and well-being. Well, join us back here next Sunday for our first reading of August. It's a throwback to our original format. And we're calling it the Wild Card Open Mic. Uh, the Wild Card Open Mic, 12 of you can, will sign up uh, in Zoom as we're gathering as an audience, six minutes a piece. Uh, so a six minute set for 12 of you. Um, and, uh, and we'll have just a, and we'll, and we'll see, we'll, we'll see what the, what the poetry, uh, gods and goddesses bring us in that, in that 12 star constellation for our wild card open mic next week. I hope you'll, I hope, I hope many of you will come join us and, and uh, try to sign up to read, but what a thing it'll be to hear um, the, the 12 poets, whomever they will be, that will come and join us next week. And we are back on Sunday, August 8th with our first new book showcase of the month of August with Julie Marie Wade, Alice Petway, and Lilla Way, another trio of poets for your good listening. Again, I hope you will join us on Thursday evening. Um, it's gonna be, again, 6.30 Mountain. That's 7, um, that's 7.30, that's 7.30, um, that's 7.30 Central um, and that would be 8.30. I might have said 9.30, but I'll get them. I'll get the time zones correct um, for our reading, benefit reading uh, with Amit. And thank you for joining us today. And as always, I end by thanking, of course, Don Krieger for being our wizard of, of the production that goes into creating Cultivating Voices and to Kim Ports Parsons for her very vivid, inviting graphics that allure you to our reading series. Oh yes, it's the poets, but also thanks to Kim's graphic design uh, spectacles that uh, are very provocative. Folks, as you've heard today, um, you know, I, our humanity really depends on our deep listening of one another and the unique stories that connect us to the earth, the planet, and to each other. So as I sign out today, please take care of yourself. Please take care of your beloveds. Please continue to take care of the planet. And of course, a great way to do that is to keep writing. I'm Sandy and I'm your host, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. We'll see you next Sunday. I will stay on for a few minutes today. If any, um, we'll keep the room open just for about maybe 10 minutes if anybody wants to chat with each other. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great week. There we go.